Welcome, this is George Della with Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, and we are coming to you tonight with our uh, Tuesday night Bible study, where we have been looking at the biblical church, and uh, what we see in the scriptures, uh, what the church looked like, what the uh, uh, main characteristics of that church was, uh, so that we can check ourselves and see as, you know, the, the modern day church, are we aligning with the church that's revealed in the scripture? And uh, before we get into the word tonight, we just want to take a minute to pray. And uh, also I want to uh, uh, just uh, tell everybody, that, uh, it, that all of those from the U.S., uh, this Thursday is Thanksgiving. We just want to wish everybody a, a happy and safe uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, this Thursday, and uh, let's remember to give God thanks uh, because He's the one that provides all that that good food and uh, stuff that we partake. And um, uh, I'm sure everybody's gonna gonna really enjoy that this week. But uh, let's let's have a word of prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. As we come together, we ask that you would open the word to our understanding and our understanding to the word that you would give each one of us that spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you better, Lord, uh, that you would uh, open the eyes of our understanding, Lord, that we would know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints and your incomparably great power for us who believe. And we pray, Lord, according to Proverbs chapter uh, 2, that uh, you would give us a heart to receive your words and to treasure your commands within us, so that we will incline our ears to wisdom and apply our hearts to understanding, to cry out for discernment, to lift up our voices for understanding, to seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, so that we might understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For it is you, Lord, who gives us wisdom. From your mouth comes knowledge and understanding, for you have stored up sound wisdom for the upright. We thank you, Father God, that you anoint the Word tonight to work effectively in each one of us to produce the fruits of your kingdom in us, Lord, and to bring us into, into obedience to your Word, Lord, as it is revealed by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as I was saying, uh, our, our last study, we uh, were looking at the biblical church because, to be honest with you, when we look at much of the church today, uh, particularly here in America, uh, it doesn't line up to what we see in the Scriptures. And uh, I, I think we really need to get back to the foundations that were laid out in the New Testament that revealed what God's heart was for His church, what He created the church to be, and what should be the primary characteristics of that church and uh, we need to get back to those things so that just as the New Testament church was very effective and uh, influenced, I mean, they had an impact on the entire known world uh, because they operated uh, as the church uh, that Jesus bought and paid for with his own blood and, and what God designed that church to be and to do. And when we look at the church today, we're not seeing it being very effective in most cases. And, uh, and in fact, the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, much of the church is not doing uh, uh, hardly any of the things that Jesus commanded us to do, and uh, definitely not showing forth the characteristics uh, that should be manifested in the church. We have to understand that the church is birth in power. The, and, and, and again, that church is birthed through us being born again, amen, by the water and the Spirit. And uh, we are baptized into the body of Christ. That's how the church is formed. We become a part of the church. It's not a building, it's people, okay? The people are the church. It's the ecclesia, the called out ones. And uh, when we are called out of the darkness, we are brought into the light. We, we, we become the church, and that church, again, is birthed in the power of God, the very dunamis of God. And through that power, God uh, puts those, uh, that character, that new nature of righteousness and holiness in us and puts that, uh, the characteristics of what that church is to be uh, in us so that uh, the church becomes a demonstration 
of what God created to be. And that's really key. Uh, everything is about uh, a demonstration, not, not just in word, but in action. Everything about the church uh, should be seen, evidenced uh, by the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, people doing the things that God called us to do. And that's what we really need to get back to. And uh, uh, last time we, we looked at two particular characteristics. The first and foremost, the most important, was the main characteristic of the church in the New Testament was love. And we looked at the fact that on one hand it was, it was our love towards God. We are commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength. And again, it's a demonstrable love. It's a love that can be seen. Okay, Jesus said they would know us by our fruits. And uh, that demonstration of our love towards God, uh, as we looked at, would be manifested in uh, worship and praise. It would be manifested in, in, in our fear, our respect of God, our reverence for God. It would be manifested in our obedience uh, uh, to God. And, uh, uh, you know, again, everything about our love for God uh, would be evidenced by the way we live, the way we act, the way we obey God and do the things that God has called us to do. And then secondly, uh, that love of the church was to be uh, to each other. We are to love our brethren as we, as we love ourselves. And again, it's a demonstrable love. As James put it in John, uh, I'm sorry, uh, John put it in 1 John 3.18, he says, little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, if your love can't be seen, it's probably not real. Okay? And, and the church demonstrated that love uh, through their relationships uh, with one another in the New Testament church. We saw it where, uh, to the degree that they would even sell what they have to make sure that there was no need among them. And they demonstrated that love in uh, many ways. And uh, Paul talks about uh, over 60 times in his letters to the churches, talks over 60 times about the church one anothering, praying for one another, helping one another, exhorting one another, watching over one another, caring for one another. Over 60 times he, 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 he gave the church, he, he, he encouraged them to fulfill these things toward one another because again, that love needed to be demonstrated, needed to be seen in evidence. Because again, uh, when the world, when the loss, when unbelievers see the demonstration of God's love in the church, both for God and for each other, it, it convicts them. It, 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 it uh, uh, strikes them. It's something, because in the natural, we don't have that kind of love. It's, it's, the, it's the agape love of God. It's that unconditional love of God. And the world doesn't have that. So when they see it demonstrated, that's what's going to draw them to Christ. That's what's going to uh, uh, want them to have what the church has. And then the second thing we looked at was discipleship. When Jesus uh, commanded the church before he left, he, see, he told them he's gonna, they, they were to go and to wait for the Holy Spirit because uh, God was going to send the Holy Spirit to dwell in his church, in his people. And the purpose, uh, the primary purpose of having the Spirit of God was that we would carry on the works of Christ to seek and save that which is lost. And so Jesus commanded the church, the, one of the last things he told them before he ascended into heaven, was that they were to go and make disciples of every nation. They were to go to preach this gospel to every creature. And the church took it seriously. And we, we see that demonstrated all through the book of Acts. They went out and did exactly what Jesus said to do. And uh, they, they uh, went forth as we saw in, in, in uh, the book of Mark, and uh, 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 obeyed Jesus. And they went out and made disciples, and they preached the gospel, and, and the church grew. I mean, from, from a small group, uh, in, in a short period of time, there were hundreds of thousands into millions uh, of Christians uh, because the church was obedient to do those things. And again, uh, uh, this is why we, we need to look at this and understand these characteristics of a church be, because we're not seeing them manifested in that way today. We're not seeing the church demonstrating that love both for God and for one another the way it ought to be in deed and in action. We're not seeing the church 
as a whole, going out and, and preaching the gospel and making disciples of every nation and, and being that witness wherever they are and wherever God sends them. And in fact, again, as I said last time, uh, the vast majority of professing Christians have never shared the gospel with anybody, have never made a disciple, have never fulfilled the very basic commandment of Jesus to go and make disciples, to go and preach the gospel. They've never done it, even though they've been in the church for 5, 10, 30, 50 years. The majority has never fulfilled this commandment. So again, this is why we're not seeing the church being a light and having the effect that the early church did upon the, 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 the first centuries, upon the entire world. We're not seeing that uh, happening today because, again, the people aren't doing what God called us to do. Now, the third characteristic I want to look at was the Word of God. The, 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 the next priority of the New Testament church was uh, to be in the Word of God. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, uh, immediately after Peter preached, 3,000 people got saved. And in Acts chapter 40, uh, 2, 42, he tells us, what they did, one of the first things they did, he says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. In other words, in the word of God. They continued in the teachings of the apostle. They continued steadfastly. That, that was one of their priorities, okay? And, and again, I've, I've, uh, you can go on Facebook or YouTube, and I've got uh, 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 videos on there talking about the making of a disciple, the, how important the Word is, and all of the things that, that the Word produces. And, and that's why we're told uh, we are to, if we're a true disciple of Jesus Christ in John chapter 8, Jesus says, if you abide in my Word, you are my disciples indeed. Why? Be, because everything God does, both in us and through us, is via the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Everything he does, I don't care what it is, whatever you can think of, salvation, healing, deliverance, uh, uh, sanctification, cleansing, washing, everything God does is by the Word and the Spirit. And so, again, when we look at a church today that's disobedient, that's anemic, that's, that's powerless, that's, that's uh, diso uh, disobedient, all of the things that we're looking at that shouldn't be, is one of the primary reasons is because, again, the same way that much of the church uh, is not uh, obeying the commandment of Jesus to make disciples, the same way much of the church does not live and abide in the Word of God in any real and practical way. When he says abide in the Word, he's talking about that means to live in it. That means, that, like, like Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's how important it is. It's your very life. And, and uh, again, that's a whole other sermon. But the early church understood that. And so there was a lot of teaching going on. And, and the people were, were uh, continued steadfastly in that word. And uh, they got together daily and uh, fellowshiped with each other. And part of that fellowship was the word of God. And uh, each one learned and contributed and uh, they, they were even commanded that you know they were to teach others so how can you teach others except you've been taught amen you got to be in the word and the holy spirit is the one who teaches you in isaiah chapter 54 he says the servant of god says the lord god has given me the tongue of a disciple and of one who is taught that i should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary he wakens me morning by morning. Morning, He wakens my ear to hear as a disciple, as one who is taught. That's Isaiah 54 in the Amplified Bible. So what is it? A disciple is somebody who, who sits under the teaching of God's Word. They are taught by the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, again, so that they have something to give. Okay, If there's no Word in you, there's nothing to come out of you. You got to put the word in. In fact, not in you. It's got to be in your heart. It needs to be hidden in your heart. It needs to take root in your heart. Because the only way the word can produce the fruits of God's kingdom in your life is that it has to be rooted in your heart. And uh, that's what the Holy Spirit will do. He will root that word in it as you 
as you welcome it, receive it as it is the Word of God, as you meditate on it, and by faith uh, receive it and let it work in you. Amen? They were taught to teach, and uh, they were taught to know the ways of God and to fulfill the commands of God. Uh, again, another reason why you have to be in the Word of God. How can you know the commands of God except you abide in the Word of God? Because everything that... Uh, we're required to follow everything that God has called us to, uh, uh, to do is in the Bible, okay? And, and, and again, we're not talking about, you know, going to Sunday, Sunday uh, service and hearing somebody preach. That's not what he's talking about, okay? Paul, uh, uh, or Peter says, as a newborn babe, you should crave, you should have this hunger, this desire in you that God placed in you when you were saved to do what? To crave the pure Word of God. Not the regurgitated Word of somebody else, but the pure Word of God. Why? Because there's power in that Word. There's revelation in their word. that Word. There's wisdom. There's understanding. There's healing. Again, everything that God has come to do is in that Word. It's there to that you can grow up spiritually. And again, when we look at today's church, <coughs> excuse me, when we look at today's church, and we look at the spiritual condition, when we look at the immaturity that is in so many of professing Christians who have been uh, uh, in the church for many, many years, and we see that they're still like little babes, that, that they're so immature. Why is that? Well, because spiritual growth can only uh, truly be accomplished effectively by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Holy Spirit has come to be our teacher. Okay? He's the one that's got to, to, to open the word to our understanding. He's the one who's got to lead us and guide us into the truth. He's the one that's got to illuminate the word so that it becomes a revelation and uh, produces the fruit of God in us. Okay? In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, uh, the, the, the church was rebuked. He says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. That was a rebuke. He was saying, you've been saved for a while now. You've been in the church for a while now. And uh, I once, once asked the Lord what that means. And, and the Lord told me, well, generally, by three years, if there's no fruit, if someone's not producing the fruits, if there's no signs of spiritual growth, uh, he, he showed me that parable when, when the... Uh, 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 the, the, the tree where there was no fruit after three, year, three years. He said, cut it down. Let's not allow that tree just to take up the resource and take up the, the, the air, the water, and the, the resources that are necessary. Cut it down. If it's not bearing fruit after three years, there's something wrong with it. Well, it's the same thing in the church. If, if, if you're not in the Word of God and you're not able to teach others after three years of being a Christian, something's wrong. And we need to go back, get back to the cross, get back to the basics, go back in, in prayer and ask God to, to restore that hunger, that thirst, and to develop those, those habits in your life that you're going to abide in that Word of God, that you're going to have a daily devotion in the Word of God. And, and I'm talking about some substance. I'm not talking about taking five minutes. We owe God a, a, a tithe of our time. Amen? There's 24 hours in a day. That's, that, that, that means we owe God, we, owe God uh, we should be giving God, whether it be in the Word and prayer and worship and all these different things, a, a tithe of our time. And uh, uh, because, again, He should be the priority, the preeminence, the, the first love, the, the, uh, our, our, our devotion. I mean, He should be the, 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 the first in our life of everything. Well, if that's really true, then He ought to have the first fruits of our time, amen, as well. Now, through that word, they were taught to have faith in Christ, okay? They go hand in hand. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So they were taught to be a people of faith that depended upon God for all things. They, they understood the importance of that word and that, again, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And, and as we said earlier in John chapter 8, 31, Jesus said to those who believed in him, if you abide in my words, you are my disciples indeed. In other words, you're really my disciples. You're truly my disciples. That's what he was saying. And if we're not abiding in the word, then just the opposite is true. 
then we're not his disciples indeed. There's something wrong with our relationship, and we need to fix it. We need to repent and ask God again to give us that love for his word and to start uh, uh, making that effort to get in that word and do the things that uh, 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 God has called us uh, to do, that we live in that word day by day. And again, 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If you're not growing spiritually, it's probably because you're not abiding in the word of God. Because just like a newborn babe in the natural, it requires the mother's milk, okay? Everything that baby needs to grow and develop the way God designed is in that breast milk of the mother, okay? That's the best milk for that child because God has, has put in it everything for growth that that child needs. Well, the same thing. The Word of God is the milk of God, and God has put everything in that Word to produce spiritual growth in His children. So again, if we are not in the Word of God, and again, every word of God. That means the whole Bible. We need, to, we need to learn how to read the entire Bible over and over again. That we get the whole counsel of God, the whole word of God. Every scripture is God breathed. It comes from the mouth of God. And it has something in it that we need. Amen? Well, we got to get back to that. Again, the majority of the, today's church has no appetite for abiding in the word of God. And, and, and again, what do we do? We would rather pay others uh, uh, to do it for us. And what we have done in, in today's modern day church, we have relegated uh, ourselves to the teaching of others and we have no real uh, knowledge of truth for ourselves. And that is a sad indictment against the church. And what is the result of that is a very weak, anemic church with little biblical revelation, with little discernment, and uh, with little spiritual growth. And that's why, again, the church is so immature and uh, uh, remains in dependency upon the pastor or church leaders. And that was not God's intent. We are all to come into maturity. We are all to grow into the fullness of Christ, our head. We are all to become the ministers of God, teachers of others, and doing the works of God uh, through that word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 7, he says, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What's he saying? Because we're just listening to others instead of abiding in the word of God to gain the truth for ourselves as the Holy Spirit uh, opens that word to us and uh, enlightens us with it to bring us into the true knowledge of God. In John 16, 13, he says, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He's talking about the, one of the primary persons of the Holy Spirit coming to us. He's the spirit of truth. He's our teacher. Amen. He comes to teach us individually. He comes to reveal, to open the word, to, to give us understanding, to give us that revelation, to guide us into all truth. And it's the truth that will set you free. Why is there so much captivity that we see in the church? Because again, we're not relying on the Holy Spirit and abiding in that word to get that revelation of the truth that will set us free and bring us into the true liberty of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, he says, But the anointing which you have received uh, uh, from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing uh, teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and as just as it is taught you, you will abide in him. There it is. What's he talking about? The Holy Spirit. You have an anointing from God. You have the Spirit of God uh, who comes. He is your primary teacher. Now, please, don't take this out of context. Don't, don't, don't take this wrong. Okay? The, there's a purpose for the fivefold ministry. God gives us teachers. God gives us pastors and, and prophets and and uh, he, there's a purpose for that. They are there uh, to help us develop, to help us uh, uh, grow up so that we can be taught by the Holy Spirit and we're not dependent upon them to that degree anymore. That's the purpose, that we grow into maturity. Just like, you know, with our own children. When you have a baby, you expect that child to grow up, to develop into an adult and, and to become self-dependent and, and uh, independent and, and uh, uh, you know, to, to live and act like an, like an adult. 
And, and it's the same thing in the church. God uh, wants every one of us to become, to come into maturity, to come into that fullness, and to be uh, 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 independent in the sense that uh, uh, we have God, we have the Word of God. So even if, if for some reason, uh, 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 you know, we are not able to to uh, have the teachings of, of others, it doesn't matter because we have the Holy Spirit to teach us. And, and we teach others. And, and again, uh, part of the Great Commission, what did Jesus say? That uh, uh, we are to go to make disciples. And how do we make the disciples? Well, I mean, what do we do when we get these people saved? We are to teach them to obey everything God commanded us. We are to teach them, to help develop them, to bring them into maturity, to help them grow spiritually, okay? And how do we do that? Again, one of the primary things is we have to teach them to teach themselves. We have to teach them to abide in the Word, to teach them to be led by the Spirit of God, to depend upon the Holy Spirit, because again, ultimately, everything uh, that we're talking about when we talk about the primary characteristics of the church is totally dependent upon the church being a Holy Spirit church, every Christian being a Holy Spirit church, that we are led by the Spirit, taught of the Spirit, directed of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, dependent upon Him. Everything is about the Holy Spirit, and that's what the whole book of Acts was about. It was the acts of the Holy Spirit, and it was manifested through a Holy Spirit church. We got to get back to that, amen? We need to be a Holy Spirit church that uh, are doing the things of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that begins by being taught by the Holy Spirit. And that is the next characteristic, uh, number four. One of the primary characteristics of the, of the church was to be a Holy Spirit church. The New Testament church was a church of the Holy Spirit. They depended upon the Holy Spirit for everything they did. They were led by the Spirit. They sought the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit. When they had problems, they, they got in prayer and looked to the Holy Spirit. When they were ministering, they depended upon the Holy Spirit. When they went out and uh, did the works of the gospel, they, they relied upon the Holy Spirit to do what God said He would do. When they preached the gospel, they expected the Holy Spirit to move through them and heal the sick, drive out demons, save people. They expected those things to happen. Why? Because they were a Holy Spirit church. So even... In the early stages of the church, when as they were going out and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and declaring Jesus to be the Son of God and, and the Savior raised from the dead, they started getting opposition from the Jews. They got started getting opposition from uh, 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 the unbelievers. And it was coming from every side. They were, they were being brought before the Sanhedrin and challenged and beaten and, and all these things. They were being persecuted. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, well, look what happened after after having been uh, 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 arrested and, and told not to preach the gospel anymore and beaten. They got together, and what did they do? They weren't about to quit. They weren't about to stop obeying God, to go and preach the gospel to every creature. They weren't going to stop doing what God called them to do. So he says, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. <clears throat> Amen. And what? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, we're talking about a refilling. Okay, Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5. We are to be continuously filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. We're to drink daily of God's Spirit. I don't know about you. I need more of the Holy Spirit all the time. And so I do exactly what the Bible says. How much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Okay? He's not just talking about that initial... And he's talking about a continuous drinking. We're to be continually filled with the Spirit of God. And with the measure we use, it shall be measured back to us. So the more we walk in the Spirit and we rely upon the Spirit in everything we do, everything we, we, we go about in the works of the ministry, and uh, being led by the Spirit and uh, dependent upon Him to, to, to teach us and all the things He has come to do to empower us so that we can do the works of the gospel, well... The more we do that, the more we need, and the more God will give us. But again, if we're not using uh, the Spirit, if we're not walking in the Spirit and operating in the Spirit, then God's not going to bring the increase. There's no need for it, because it would just be a waste. Amen? Again, we got to get back to being this Holy Spirit church. So, again, in Acts 4.31, uh, after being persecuted, they just went to God. God, listen, we're not going to stop doing what you called us to do. 
but we need some help here. We're being persecuted. What do we do? Well, God says, here's your answer. I'll give you some more Holy Spirit. And guess what? And they spoke the word of God with boldness. In other words, God gave them the boldness to keep doing what he called them to do and uh, 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 gave them that strength, gave them that, uh, that anchor in their souls that no matter if they were persecuted or even put to death, they were not going to disobey the commandment of Jesus to go and make disciples. Because why? They were a people of the Holy Spirit. They were a spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-driven church. And that's what we need today. Amen. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2 and 3, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, what happened? The Holy Spirit said, again, every time the church come together or every time they were doing something for God, no matter what it was about, it was always the Holy Spirit showing up. Again, that's what I'm telling you. The book of Acts was the acts of the Holy Spirit. And what did the Holy Spirit do? He gave them direction. He says, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. He, he was answering their prayer. They were seeking God's direction. How did God bring it? He brought it by the Holy Spirit. And having fasted and prayed and laid his hands on them, they sent them away. When the Holy Spirit spoke, they obeyed. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. And when God tells you to do something, that's what you do. I'm telling you, we have got to get back to being a Holy Spirit church and start obeying the things that God tells us to do. And again, start listening. Start listening. Start looking for the Holy Spirit to do the things that God sent him to do. Expect him to do it. Expect him to show up and teach us. Expect him to show up and give us direction. Expect him to show up to bring healing and deliverance and, and to uh, do whatever God uh, 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 has sent him to do to help us fulfill and do the things that Jesus sent us to do to fulfill this great gospel commission. Okay? God is building a church, and uh, in Zechariah, he talks about this true temple of the Lord that would come forth. I believe that's where we're headed. God wants to build the true temple of the Lord, and again, it's not built by the hands of men. It's not built by the traditions of men. It's not built by the schemes of men. It is a church built by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the kingdom of God is a kingdom of power. And in order, the only way that we can do what God's called us to do is that we have to be endued with power from on high by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I tell you what, every time that we receive more of the Spirit, we receive more of the Holy, of, of God's power. Remember we just looked at, uh, we just read in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 27, but the anointing which you received from Him abides in you. Okay, there's an anointing. Okay, what did, what, did, what did Acts tell us in Acts 26, 18? He says, how Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. He told the church the purpose, one of the primary purposes of, of the coming of the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us was to endue us with power so that we can be the instruments of God to do the same works that Jesus did and even greater works to give evidence that Jesus is the Christ, to give evidence that he was raised from the dead. And the evidence is the mighty signs and wonders, the bringing forth of the kingdom of God in power as God heals the sick and, and drives out demons and, and brings transformation to the lives of people that we preach to. Amen? Now, I'm just touching on some of these, okay, uh, because I, I wanted to finish this part, this, this up today, because there's something I want to get into the next time. So uh, just one last thing about that. That church, the New Testament church, is what we have to get back to. And what was the New Testament church? It was a church that was spirit-led, it was spirit-filled, it was spirit-driven, and it was spirit-taught. And the people were dependent upon the Holy Spirit for everything they did. Amen? Everything they knew. It was not of them. It was of God. It was God working through them by means of His Spirit. And again, without Jesus, you can't do anything. Okay? Well, without the Holy Spirit, you can't do anything. Okay? We can't accomplish anything. We can't produce anything. We can't be effectual. We must depend upon the Spirit of God. We must be a Spirit-filled people, a Spirit-led people, and a Spirit-driven people. Okay? Number five, the early church, one of the major characteristics of that church was fellowship. The New Testament church gave great priority to fellowship and communion. Okay? And again, this is something we have lost in today's church. 
it, 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 it's something about this culture that we have created. And uh, you, you look at the, the, the young people coming up today. They don't know how to communicate with each other other than texting and, and uh, messaging and you know, using phones and using social media. But they don't, they, they don't understand uh, how to have real fellowship, face-to-face, -face, speaking with one another, you know, uh, uh, having a communion with each other. That, that's uh, something that's been lost in this culture, and it's affected the church as ever, uh, 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 also uh, today. I mean, when I was growing up, we didn't need an appointment to go see somebody. Uh, you know, to, we, if we were going down the road and we we're passing by uh, uh, my aunt's house, we just stop in and uh, say hello and, and uh, fellowship for a while and then head on our way. We didn't need an appointment uh, to go visit somebody, you know, especially our relatives. I mean, that's just what you did. And, and we would get together regularly. Uh, we always had uh, people coming together to eat and to fellowship and, and uh uh, you, you know, not just holidays, not just for Thanksgiving, or not just for Christmas. We got together all the time because, again, family, okay? Well, that's what the church did. That's how they operated, amen? In, in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, again, those 3,000 people got saved. But notice what it says about that church. Notice the characteristic that was put into them, that this was imparted into them through that saving work of Christ. It says, uh, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, okay, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, okay? The church saw fellowship as extremely important, and they would go to each other's houses, and they would fellowship, and they would have communion together, and, and, and uh, much of what the early church did back in those days, I mean, uh, that was a cultural thing with them. Uh, they would get together and eat meals together. Breaking bread together was a covenant thing uh, 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 in the Bible, okay? They, they, they would get together. You see it a lot in the Old Testament when uh, uh, they made a covenant with each other, uh, different groups of people. They would sit down and they would eat together. They would break bread together as a sign uh, 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 of that covenant that was being made, okay? The church understood that in the New Testament church. And so that was a regular part uh, uh, of being the church, was this fellowship with one another. And, uh, and again, if you, when, you, when you study the scriptures, you're going to find that uh, this, this, this fellowship actually begins with God. We are called into fellowship with the Father. We are called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus, we are called into fellowship with the Holy Spirit, okay? God has called us to himself to be in this continual fellowship with him, a continual communion with him, that we, we have this intimate relationship with him, okay? We are to abide in God as God abides in us. That's how intimate he's talking about. We literally become one with God, one with the Father, one with the Son, one with the Holy Spirit, Okay? Well, guess what? He calls the church into that same fellowship with each other. We are called to be one with each other. We literally uh, become part of each other. And we are to walk in that fellowship and live in that fellowship in a real and practical way. And that's what we see demonstrated in the early church. And uh, uh, again, they, they would depend upon one another. Uh, all of these things we've been talking about. I mean, when they got together, they would, they would be in the Word. They would be in prayer. They would have communion. They would encourage one another. They would exhort one another. Uh, you know, all of, again, well, just look up the word one anothering. Look up that phrase in the letters of Paul. And like I said, over 60 times, he talks about the church one anothering. And that's how important it is. And we need to get back to that, where we see fellowship uh, as a vital part of the New Testament church, that we fellowship with each other. We make that a part of our uh, 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 church life, that uh, we have face-to-face -face time with each other, where we visit each other in each other's home. We have communion with each other, and we, we get together and have meals with each other, and we discuss the Word. I'm not talking about, you know, some of the fellowship we, we claim to have today is pretty much nonsense because it's all... Uh, talking about worldly stuff and gossip and all these things. No, 
We're talking about fellowship where you get together and you're there to build one another up, to edify one another, to, to, to demonstrate the love of Christ, to uh, 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 encourage one another, and all the things the church ought to be doing in that way. We've got to get back to that. Amen? And then number six, the New Testament church was a church of prayer. They understood the importance of prayer. In uh, uh, Isaiah 56, 7, he says, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Okay, what's that mean? If something's called a house of prayer, what does that tell us about uh, one of the primary characteristics of that house? Prayer is one of the primary characteristics. We are called to be a house of prayer, individually and corporately, which means this, that individually and corporately, one of the primary characteristics of our life should be prayer, that we live a life of prayer every day, just like we are in the Word every day. We're in prayer every day. We're spending time uh, with God, uh, not just to, to ask God for things, but to listen to what God has to say to us. Prayer is a two-way communication, okay? Uh, and again, you can go on my YouTube or Facebook, I have a whole sermon on that. What really is prayer? And uh, it will really uh, uh, change the way you pray and what you, the way you think about prayer. But the church understood this. And every time they get together, you read some of the early writings back from the first centuries that talked about what they did when they got together to church, and they always prayed. There was always prayer a part of what they did. Because again, they were a people that were dependent upon God. They understood the power of prayer. They understood this, this gift of grace that God had given them, this power that God had given to us as, as His children that comes through prayer, through this, this uh, communication with the Almighty God. So we, can, we can talk with Him and walk with Him, and, and uh, uh, God will answer our prayers. He will hear us. In fact, uh, I love... Uh, uh, in 1 John chapter 5, when he talks about uh, 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 this, this, this assurance, this boldness that we have in Christ, that if we ask God anything in the name of Jesus, He will do it. And when we know He'll do it, we know that we have what we've asked of Him. That's the power of that prayer. If we ask anything in His name, anything according to His will... God's going to do it. Why? Because he stands behind his word to do it. And the church understood that. And again, that's why over and over again, you'll see in the book of Acts, they prayed. We just looked at a couple examples right there. When they were persecuted, they, what did they do? They got together and they prayed. They went to God. They went to the, the one in power. They went to him to get the answers. When they were looking, what, what did God want them to do next? When they, the, the, Again, in Acts 13, when they, the, the church in Antioch, what did they do? They, they prayed and they fasted, looking to God for the answers. What happened? God answered their prayer and uh, 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 did exactly what needed to be done. And a really good example was when Peter was thrown into prison, what the Bible say the church was doing? They all got together, where? At somebody's house. I believe it was Mark's house. They all got together. What were they doing at that house? Praying. And what were they praying about? They were praying for Peter. Amen. And what happened? God heard their prayers, and God sent an angel and delivered Peter out of the, out of the prison. You see, they understood the power of prayer. We need to understand the power of prayer because, again, this is another false, uh, 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 falling short we see in the church today. Not only do we lack uh, 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 the Word of God, abiding the Word of God, we're really lacking that fellowship. We're, we're, we're lacking this prayer, okay? We have got to be a people of prayer, knowing that we have a God that is all-powerful, almighty, and ever-listening. Ever-listening. And even has given us the Holy Spirit so, so that when we don't even know how to pray, we don't know what to pray, we can pray in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will pray through us the perfect will of God to, re, to, to, to deal with that situation. Amen? In Acts 29, uh, uh, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word, and uh, so what are they doing? They're, they're praying. They're, they're praying to God by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. 
And when they had prayed, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of boldness. Okay? God answered their prayer. God gave them what they needed. Amen? Why? Because when they had prayed, God answered. Okay? There's a whole lot of stuff not happening because we don't pray. we got to be a people of prayer. That needs to be one of our priorities. We need to learn how to depend upon God and to seek Him in everything we say and do. And again, not just to be always, you know, God do this and God do that, but listening to God because God wants to talk to you. God wants to speak to us. God wants to say something. But we got to wait upon the Lord. We got to learn to part to understand that part of praying is waiting, listening to the voice of God. Okay, but again, God God is waiting for our prayers to answer them. He we need we need to pray for God's direction. We need to pray like they did for His power, for His presence. We need to pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need to pray for our leaders, for our our nations, for the work of the kingdom, for revival, for awakening. I mean, the Bible even tells us specifically a lot of things we need to be praying about. They're right there in the Bible. Timothy talks about it. Amen. Somebody declares a Paul. Talk. He tells us what we ought to be praying about. And that's what we ought to be doing. And especially praying for one another. Amen. Praying for one another. Prayer was the backbone to everything they did. Amen. Now, the seventh primary characteristic of the church. Uh, and, and again... I'm just giving you the, uh, the, the core, the primary, the, the basic. Uh, there's a lot of other things the church was involved in. But these are seven primary basic things that every church should be operating in, that, that should be a part of every church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because this is what God designed the church to have, to be. Okay, These were things that God uh, when he when he brought forth the New Testament church, were to be integral parts of it because these are necessary for everything the church is to be about. And so number seven was obedience. Obedience. Okay, we cannot call ourselves a church unless we are going to do the things that make a church a church. And again, not according to the dictates of man and the traditions of man and the and these, these, all these gimmicks that men come up with, but according to the Word of God, okay? The church must be built on the commandments of Jesus Christ. God's laid it all out for us in the New Testament. It's all there. If we abide in that Word and we're dependent upon the Holy Spirit to teach us and to enlighten us, God has laid out everything in His Word, how to build the church, how to... How to, uh, the things that we ought to be involved in and everything we ought to be about and everything we are doing and, and everything about the kingdom of God is all right there in the word of God. But again, like James says, we're not to be hearers only. We're to be doers of the word of God. If you're not going to do the word of God, then the, the reality is you need to go back and get on your face before God and cry out in repentance. Go back to the cross and find out what's wrong inside of you that you're not obedient to the things that God says do. Because if we really understand the scriptures, if we're not being obedient, there's something wrong with our relationship with God. In fact, one of the, the, the biggest indictments of the last days uh, uh, that Jesus gave to the last days church was said, what is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. What was he saying? He was saying, listen, just, the, just professing Jesus as your Lord with no obedience. He says, you're not saved. I never even knew you. You're still lawless. You're still under the power of sin. That's what he was saying. But no, he says many, many people have that profession. Many people say, Lord, Lord, but they don't do what Jesus says. In fact, in Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say do? What was the point? How, how can you say I'm your Lord if you're not going to obey me? I'm not your Lord if you don't do what I say do. I'm just something that you're just using for your own purpose. And that's not going to happen. God, God's not going to, God doesn't work that way. Amen? And again, Matthew 28, 19, 
uh, again, what was one of the primary uh, uh, parts of that gospel commission? Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Okay, why? Because that is the pro one of the purpose, primary purposes of the church, to do what God says do. We're not our own. Amen. It's not about us. It's about obedience. In fact, in 1 John, he tells us, what is one of the very basic definitions of love towards God? It's to obey his commandments. Okay? Jesus himself said, if you don't obey my commandments, you don't love me. It's that simple. I mean, he doesn't mince words. He doesn't mince words. If you really love me, you will obey my commandments. You'll do what I say. But if you don't obey my commandments, the reality is, you do not really love me. And, and, and that is the, 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 the very root of salvation. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. I mean, the whole, the whole purpose of coming to Christ upon that cross was to circumcise this, this self-love, this, this, this selfishness out of us, that pride. That the, all the, it was to cut that out, to circumcise our hearts. Why? So that we can be empowered, so we are able to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, and strength, and to de demonstrate that by obeying Him, by doing the things that God has called us to do. And again, this is what I'm saying. This is why this teaching right here is so vital. It is so important because if we're not doing the things that God called us to do, if we're not abiding in the Word, if we're not in prayer, being uh, dependent upon the Holy Spirit and living in fellowship and you know all these things we're talking about here, if we're not doing these things, we're being disobedient. And we're not being effective. We're not doing. We're not able to produce the things that God has called us to produce. And so we're failing Him as a church, because the church has a mission and a commission from God. Amen. Romans uh, uh, fifteen eighteen. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. Paul, right there, he tells us one of the purposes of of, of, of the, the very purposes of the gospel was to bring people into obedience to Jesus Christ, to bring people into obedience to the Word of God, uh, because that's what it's about, okay? God's commandments were given to us for a purpose. It's to fulfill His kingdom purposes, okay? And really, we got to change our attitude when it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to the commandments of God. We really need to understand something. Every commandment of God, the context that was given Him, was the number one. It's given uh, based on God's love for us, okay? Those commandments, okay, uh, show God's love for us. What God is, is, has, has come to show that love to us, okay? And then it's to show our love towards God. Our obedience is a, is a, a manifestation of our love for God, to show Him in a real and practical way that we demonstrate that love through our obedience, and then thirdly, every commandment, the commandments of God, the, the, the root purpose is our love for each other. Okay? In fact, he tells us that the whole law is fulfilled in this, uh, that we love one another. Okay? Because love does no harm. Okay? Love doesn't, doesn't hurt other people. Okay? So, so really, when you understand why he's given us these commandments... Okay? It has to do with those three things. It's based on those three things. God's love for us, our love for God, and our love for one another. Okay? It's not to put us into bondage. It's not to, uh, you know, God, God trying to, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, do us harm. Every word of God is for our good. Every command is for our good. Okay? And when we really obey the commandments of God, we'll find out that it truly is for our good. Because all God's benefits, His blessings, His favor, the, these things are, are, are uh, 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 brought uh, forth in fullness through our obedience to the things of God. Amen? Now, if we're not willing to obey the commands of Christ, we cannot call ourselves a church of Jesus Christ. Because again, He is the head of the church. So if we're not going to obey Him... He's not the head, and uh, uh, we're not a true church of Jesus Christ, okay? We are, we are commanded to love one another. We're commanded to serve one another, to be at peace with one another, to be hospital to one another, 
to receive one another, to admonish one another, to greet one another, to care for one another, to bear the burdens of one another, to show deference to one another, to forgive one another, to be kind to one another, to submit to one another, to provoke one another, to good works, to comfort one another, to concern ourselves in the affairs of one another, to pray for one another, to be like-minded with one another, to highly esteem one another, to have fellowship with one another, to edify one another, to teach one another, to do good to one another, to exhort to one another, and to minister to one another. So right there is a mouthful. Go and read those uh, in, the, in the New Testament, in the, particularly the letters of Paul. We're, we're commanded to do these things to one another, but how can we be fulfilling these if we don't even know what they are? Because we're not abiding in the Word and we're not obeying the things that God told us to do. Okay, But again, all of these things are designed to build up the whole body into Christ in love. To build the church up in love. To, to show forth the manifestation of God through his church. Okay, We're also commanded on the other side, we're not to fight with one another. We're not to envy one another. We're not to lie to one another. We're not to hate one another. We're not to speak evil of one another. We're not to hold a grudge with one another. We're not to be partial to be one another. Okay, So again, that's to keep unity. That's to keep peace. That's to keep love. That's to keep... Uh, us in right relationship with each other, walking in that love towards each other. Amen? Listen, the church was never designed to be a business, okay? It's not an organization. It's not a corporation. It's not a business entity. The church was designed to be a community of believers, a household of faith, brothers and sisters who love God and love one another in demonstrable ways. They live in love and fellowship and unity. They exemplify the nature and character of Christ and they follow Him in all of their ways. The church was designed to know and love God so much that we are willing to step out of our comfort zones to extend God's love, His fellowship, and His unity to everybody around us. Amen? We don't need buildings. We don't need sound systems. We don't need choirs. We don't need programs. Okay? Listen, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those. I'm not saying that uh, 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 they, they, they are nice to have, but you don't need those things to be a church. Those are not the things that define a church because, again, the church is not things and buildings. The church is people. All we need is the love of God, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and one another. That's what the church is about. We can do with or without those other things. The early church had none of those things, and yet look what they did. They impacted the entire world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How much more could we do if we got our focus all off, off the things, amen, and started focusing on people, on what we're to be about and what we're supposed to exemplify and to be doing in obedience to God. If we want to be called a church, we must be a church, not according to the traditions of men, but according to the word of God. Amen. 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 Well, this is again a mouthful. I've given you a lot of scriptures. Also, part one uh, uh, was, was a couple weeks ago. Uh, these, these will be on Facebook. They're, well, the other one, part one's already on Facebook and YouTube. This one will be on Facebook as soon as we're done, and it'll be on YouTube to, uh, 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 tomorrow, hopefully. And uh, you can go back and, and uh, listen to these, write down the scriptures, and look them up for yourself. Be like the Bereans. Don't take me for what I'm telling you. Get in the Word of God. Let the Holy Spirit show you and teach you the truth. Because again, it's time for the church to be the church. It's time for the Christians to be Christians. And to demonstrate these things that God designed the church to be about. And, and uh, characteristics that should be the uh, primary part of the true church of Jesus Christ. We need to get back to these basics so that the world can see and know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and they can see it and know it through a church that is walking out the reality and demonstrating uh, uh, what a church truly is. Uh, amen? In Jesus' name. Before we go, I want to pray for you. And again, I want to wish everybody uh, in the U.S. who's celebrating Thanksgiving on Thursday, happy Thanksgiving to all of you. And... Uh, uh, we, we will be back and, and let me throw this out. I forgot also, uh, I'm going to be out of town in, uh, first part of December. 
So our next uh, Tuesday night meeting will be the third Tuesday of December. I believe that's December 18th. Uh, we'll be back, and then in January, we'll be back on schedule, first and uh, uh, third Tuesdays, and continuing the Word of God in December. I've got a powerful message. You don't want to miss it. Uh, uh, it'll be a blessing for you. So uh, join with me then. And uh, right now, I want to just do with the Bible what we've been talking about right here. I want to pray. <laughs> Amen. I want to pray. I want to pray for you in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for every person that's been watching uh, this video, listening to the Word of God. I pray, oh God, for those that are uh, suffering uh, at this time, maybe sickness, disease, going through tribulations, problems, Lord, that uh, are facing this holiday with, with uh, uh, having to go through things. Lord, some people may be alone. Some people may be struggling with uh, uh, issues in their life. And I, I want to pray, Lord God, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you will do exactly what the uh, what you you uh, what was prayed in Acts chapter four uh, by by that early church. That Lord God, you would stretch forth your hand and heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through your holy servant Jesus for each and every person listening to this broadcast. That Lord God, they be delivered right now in Jesus' name, be healed in Jesus' name. That, Lord, hearts be mended, Lord. Sickness, disease, death and destruction be broken off, Lord. Every curse be broken off in the name of Jesus Christ. I release miracles, signs and wonders in your life. Lord, I, I release the love of Christ to a light upon the hearts of the lonely, to a light upon those that are, that are going through issues right now, family uh, problems, Lord God. I pray healing of relationships. I pray, oh God, that families will come together in love and thanksgiving for uh, 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 towards you, O oh God, uh, giving thanks, Lord, and allowing you to mend those relationships and, and to bring wholeness and soundness back to those families in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for your comfort upon those that are suffering. I pray, O oh God, that you meet the needs of every person. Uh, that your seed not be found baking bread, Lord. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are the Lord our higher, our, our, our provider. You are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. You are uh, Yahweh Shammah. You are the present God with us, Lord. Be, your, be present with your people, O oh God, right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, show the reality of your presence, Lord, as you touch your people in a real and practical way and demonstrate your love, Lord, that they will know that they know that they are never alone. They are never alone because you are always with us. God, I pray, uh, bless them. Lord, for those that are uh, traveling, uh, even myself, oh God, I pray that you will uh, protect us and keep us as we travel uh, on these busy highways. And, and again, uh, let this uh, Thanksgiving be a day of blessing and let every one of your people remember, Lord, to thank you because you are the author and the source of every blessing, of every good and perfect thing, of all the food that's given us, Lord. We just want to thank you for it in the name of Jesus Christ. And we bless you, Lord, and thank you that by his stripes we are healed. I thank you, Lord, for meeting the needs of your people in every way, shape, and form. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. And amen. Again, this is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries. I'm coming to you from Toronto, Ohio. And uh, I just want to encourage you to keep looking up because your redemption draws nigh. And uh, I bless you. Thank you for being with us. Send forth your love. Have a happy Thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.